I'm ready. Great to have you on the show, Kendra. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I haven't had too many women on the show, so you're only like the third one. Awesome. And a good number that is, by the way. <laughs> Three, yeah, that's a good number. <laughs> <laughs> a little biblical. It is. Maybe, you know? I guess I'll have to get up to seven so I get perfection. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we all are striving for, right? Right. Striving to get to have it. Kendra, tell me, tell the listeners a little bit about your story. Sure. So I hope this brings hope to all the faithful out there because trust me, you can come back to the faith. And I am living walking proof of that. God saved me at the ripe old age of 42. And when I say saved, he pulled me out of the pits of hell. And where was I for 42 years? Um, I guess I'll just share briefly a very high level recap. So my parents, bless their heart, um, did initiate me into the church, the Catholic church. And I was confirmed Catholic. And I'm going to use air quotes. I know we're on video and some will only be listening, but I was confirmed, meaning I didn't learn anything about the faith. I went through CCD and it was on the weekends and my family did not practice. We were Christers, you know, those Christmas Easter church goers, <laughs> the ones that steal your seat at the pew. We were those people. Uh, but we never talked about religion, God, Jesus. So when I say that I wasn't confirmed, I really mean I didn't have a clue. I thought that Jesus was just God's son. I didn't know that he was God. I mean, hello, that's pretty fundamental. <laughs> Don't even get me started speaking of the Trinity about the Holy Spirit. I really had no idea. I also had no idea why Jesus even died for us. And of course, I didn't know what the Eucharist was all about. And mass for me was just boring. Get me out of here as fast as I can. So that's kind of sad, but I'm really grateful for them for initiating me into the church. So when I grew up, the world raised me. I believed every single lie the world told me would make me happy. Party hard because life is stressful. Climb the corporate ladder because, hey, you just want to make a lot of money, buy a lot of stuff. That's where the happiness is. And oh, by the way, don't forget to suck up every pleasure on the way, you know, like doing drugs. I was addicted to marijuana for about 20 years. I was drinking like a fish. I was partying all the time because I deserve it. Life is hard. I climbed that corporate ladder up to a um, executive in corporate America. So I was a chief information officer for about 15 years. I was a director and a VP for about 20 of, so you can say that I was an executive leadership uh, for most of my career. And with that came more stress, came more insecurities, came more comparisons. I mean, my value was based on what you thought of me, how much money I had, what I did for a living. My God was not God. My God was materialism all, all throughout my entire life. And I would almost call myself a hedonist. I was a very pleasure-seeking person. If it felt good, do it. That, you know, life is short, so you might as well enjoy it. And so that was my life for 42 years. And I don't know, um, it's, there, there's hope out there for so many of your friends and family and children and relatives who are not seeing God in this world and think that they don't need God because that was really my idea. I don't need God. What do I need God for? I've got this. According to the world, I'm happy. <laughs> Pretty sad, isn't it? I think it's the same story as a lot of the men that are listening right now. Yeah. This is what society tells us what we're supposed to do, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're supposed to strive and climb the corporate ladder um, he who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> right. Yeah, but that's the worldview. Right. So what, ha what happened to change you, Kendra? So probably like most of the people that might even be watching this, I wasn't looking for God. I don't need God. I got this. So then the phone rang one day 
And my father, my, not my father, but my father's girlfriend was on the other line. And she said, hey, your dad's in the hospital. He's going to have quadruple bypass surgery tomorrow. And I was floored. I thought, what? I mean, he's a 72-year-old guy, a hockey coach on ice skates. There's not like an ounce of fat on him. He's got no symptoms. What do you mean quadruple bypass surgery? So I got hit pretty hard. I didn't have to deal with too many illnesses in my family. Um, my mom was sick for a little, but for the most part, I've, I've had a pretty easy going family health situation until this came and it scared me. And it was the first time that I actually prayed for somebody other than me. So let me tell you, I did believe in God. I didn't know who God was, right? I had no idea about the Holy Trinity, but I did pray to God. <laughs> and again, I'm using air quotes, pray, because my prayer was this one way asking train of stuff. So when I was a kid, I prayed to lose weight because I struggled with my weight and I needed to be what this world told me to be. Um, I prayed for the boys to like me. I prayed for me to pass tests in college because I was out partying all night. I didn't study. I prayed to get jobs and to keep jobs as I climbed the corporate ladder. But I really never had an, a relationship with the Lord. I didn't know this love affair that can come out of prayer. And this time I got on my knees and I was bawling my eyes out, just begging God to make sure that my dad was healed, that he came through the surgery okay. And selfishly, I said, please, if he does, then please help him heal fast because he is an active man. He's going to be like horrible for all of us to deal with as he's going through the recovery. And lo and behold, he came out with flying colors, almost had this miraculous healing and was back on skates and coaching before you knew it. And I was one of those nine lepers that never went back to thank God. It didn't even occur to me. I was living my life again. As a matter of fact, my self-centered, my Trinity, my Holy Trinity was me, myself and I. <laughs> so I started going in and looking at myself saying, all right, I looked at my husband, we're both packing on like 15, 20 pounds. And I said, dude, we gotta lose some weight, man. So I saw this cleanse diet. Have you ever done a cleanse diet before? I've actually taken the cleanse packets before. Yeah, they're I've hard. The cleanse diet. <laughs> <laughs> this is supposed to be, this was a big one. So you can only eat um, free range chicken, wild caught fish, organic vegetables, water, and then you take all of these horse pills that are supposed to detox. You probably like the packets. My husband would have loved the packets, by the way, because he's not, he could ba barely swallow a baby aspirin. So you should have seen some of the um, pills that we had to take, like horse size pills. And he was like, I have to take how many of these a day? And I'm like, For how 20, long? 21. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I can't even swallow a baby aspirin. How am I going to do this? So, um, so the funny thing is I, I get this book and this is about a month after my dad's surgery and I'm reading all of the supplements and I'm writing my grocery list. And then one of the pages in the book, and this is how amazing God is. He speaks to us in so many unique ways, had a pie chart and all these little segments of your life. And one of those pieces of the pie said spirituality. And I kind of was like, wow, like I've got nothing going on in this piece of the pie. And I'm not just talking about Catholicism. I didn't even know what spirituality was. I wasn't this new age person. I didn't know about Hinduism, Buddhism. I didn't know the difference between Christianity and, and the Jewish faith or even the different denominations of Christianity. I was clueless, clueless. Again, didn't even know what Catholicism was. So God- well, You've through CCD. <laughs> right, even though I went all the way through CCD, I'm telling you, all I did was just sit there. I was memorizing prayers in the car. You know, I didn't know anything about anything. All I was just looking in my soccer uniform on a Saturday at the clock saying, come on, get this over with. We didn't talk about religion until it was Saturday morning when we're eating our fruity pebbles, getting ready to go to CCD. And my mom would say, hey, do you guys have any CCD homework? And we're all like, uh, yeah. And so we're doing our homework in the car, memorizing prayers. This is just how it was in my family. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that can relate. 
okay, so God speaks to me in this pie chart. Yeah. And I, and I say, okay, I'm cleansing my body, so I might as well cleanse my soul. And I decide that I'm going to go to church, but I'm not going to that Catholic church because I don't believe in the teachings that I know, at least some of them. And it's a bunch of rules. I don't want to change my life. I don't want to go to mass every day. I'll just go when I feel like it and get this warm fuzzy. So I decided I was going to go to this, what I would call a big box church that's close to my house because <laughs> cops are out there directing traffic. You know, I mean, there's so much going on and I'm thinking that parking lot is full every time I drive by it. It must be fun in there. And uh, so long story short, I have my family over on Easter Saturday, as we know now, or I know now, it's Holy Saturday, but we had the family over. And by the way, our cleanse is going to start on Easter Sunday, <laughs> the biggest feast day in the church. And we're going to not pretty much eat anything <laughs> and punish ourselves. We had no clue. So, ever, so I am eating the house down, like stuffing cake and cookies and wine and I went to bed that night with like the fullest stomach I was so uncomfortable because you know the next day is going to be the cleanse day you know got to get it all in because I'm not going to eat a lot for a while and it's about 11 30 and I say okay I've got to go to bed because I'm going to go to church tomorrow half of my family looks at me and says what and the other half of my family says why <laughs> So, so here I am thinking like, okay, here we go. And they're all fallen away Catholics, every single person. And so I just said, oh, I just figured it was in this pie chart. I explained to them, my husband's looking at me, you know, with like those cartoon big eye saucers saying, you don't expect me to go with you, do you? And I said, nope, this is my thing. I'm going to go by myself. But they asked me where I was going and I told them. Uh -huh. and, and then my mom's boyfriend looked at me and she goes, well, he said, why aren't you going to the Catholic church? And I said, boy, pot, kettle. I mean, it's awfully funny. You guys aren't going to church at all. And I explained my, my hypocrisy. Like, I don't want to change my life. I don't believe in all those rules. So it was like everyone in my family was like, but you're Catholic, but you're Catholic. You should be going to the Catholic church. Rah, 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 rah. And so I, I acquiesced. I just said, fine. I grabbed my phone. I found the, the nearest uh, Catholic church and the rest was history. I stepped foot in the church in Easter of 2013. So a mere seven-ish years ago. Yeah. And he changed my life. So that was all from just started with your dad went from a diet with a little pie chart <laughs> to being convinced to go to the catholic church and so what happened from there oh my gosh okay so i wake up the next morning the alarm goes off and i'm thinking whose stupid idea was this i'm hungover i'm bloated i'm going to go to church by myself which i've never done ever i've always been with my family or my I was married previously, my first husband's family. I was scared to death and I knew that I can't not go. Sorry for the double negative, but I got to go. I just told everyone I was going to go. So I got up, I got ready. I drove to the church and I walked in there scared out of my mind. I've never been to this parish, this church before. And so at least I knew when I walk in, I put my fingers in the holy water and prayed, you know, the... Um, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and bless myself. And I started following this lady. I'm looking around and I see a seat in the back row. You have no idea how jazzed I was to see that seat. I was like, yeah, score. And so the woman goes in the first uh, row in front of that. I notice that she genuflects and I'm like, okay, well, I better do that. Of course, I don't even know what the word genuflect is at that time, but I, I bend down, I make the sign of the cross. I don't know where, where she, what she's looking at. Yes, the tabernacle. I was looking up at Jesus on the cross and then she kneels down and I'm like, okay, well, I guess I better kneel down. And I'm just, I'm just sitting there going, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm completely clueless. And so then she sits back and as, the, as we're about ready to begin, the priest is coming down the side aisle where I am. 
and he's saying hello to people. And then he cuts behind me and this other gentleman in the back pew. And he says, hello, people in the back row. <laughs> so I giggle, the guy next to me giggles, and I feel this sense of relief. And I'm like, okay, a priest with a sense of humor, like who knew? And so I felt so much better. And I was just comfortable for that moment because it didn't last very long, let me tell you. He gets to the center aisle, we begin mass, and he's up on the altar, turns and faces the parishioners and says, peace be with you. And I'm thinking, I know this one. And also with you, I scream <laughs> and nobody is saying that. Do you know that I was like that Southwest commercial? I'm like, you want to get away? I just wanted to leave. I was so mortified. And I'm thinking that poor lady that's in front of me must have been thinking, oh, this girl behind me sure hasn't been here in a while. In a while. <laughs> <laughs> so by the way, if there's anyone watching who hasn't been to Mass, it is no longer and also with you. We respond with and with your spirit. So just a heads up in case you are caught off guard with that. And I didn't even know that the missile walked you through the Mass. I never opened it before. I used to sit in mass and watch little children so that they could entertain me. I would look at hairstyles and outfits, you know, and just do anything to pass the time. So from that point forward, I said, I am not going to even say the Our Father, which I still knew. And guess what? That changed a little bit, right? The hands go up and all that. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> What's happening? And of course, hey, when you don't go for 20 something years, it's, you know, it's gonna be different probably. Not a lot is different though. And by the way, when I say I haven't gone in 20 years, when I moved out of the house, I didn't go to any mass or church service, not even Chris Christmas or Easter. So that's how far off I was. Okay, so I got to share this one. Then comes communion, Holy Communion. And my family, we would walk up, receive the Lord, clearly not in a state of grace. I hadn't gone to confession forever. I didn't know about a state. I didn't know that that was even Jesus. I just thought it was bread. And sure enough, and I didn't, again, know what the bread even symbolized. And then when we were done, we would be walking out the door because we wanted to beat the traffic. So I didn't even understand what the rest of the mass, that there was more to the mass. So I'm walking, I'm in line, I'm walking up and I'm thinking, oh, big panic. What do I say when I get up there? Is it, is it thank you? <laughs> like, it can't be thank you. That sounds, that doesn't sound right. And I'm like, wait, and I'm, I'm straining to hear what the people are saying because I went completely blank. And sure enough, thank you, God. I had amen get put into my head. So I received, said amen. I went back to the pew and I thought, okay, that must've been all right. Cause the priest didn't giggle or drop his jaw or, you know, yell at me. So I was good to go. And then, or say, how long has it been since you've been to confession? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So I said, you know, I go back, I follow the lady. Oh, I got to stay on my knees and I might as well stay, continue to stay on my knees. And when people sat back, I did. And then, you know, the priest says, okay, stay tuned for some announcements. And I, I'm thinking, just get me out of here already. Like, what is all this stuff? And so he says, uh, next Sunday... Divine Mercy Sunday, we are going to have confession at two o'clock. Oh my gosh. It was a moment where everything around me sort of disappeared. And I had total peace with my mortality. I've never thought about dying much. I'm always so busy. I never am in silence. I'm in the car with the radio on. I'm in the house with the TV on. I'm going to bed with a fan on. I, I, I'm, my mind is never quiet. I'm constantly being bombarded with stuff. So at that moment, God quieted my mind and I thought about, wow, if I get hit by that proverbial bus when I walk out of this church, where am I going? Like if I believe a half of a half of a half of the mustard seed of this Catholic faith, I am going to hell. I knew I had mortal sins on my soul. Turns out I had even more mortal sins that I didn't even know were mortal sins at the time. Including but at that time, I- including the one if you would have known when you received communion. <laughs> exactly, 
exactly. But well, you didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. So just, just to let people know, if you don't know, then you know, you're ignorant to it. But once you do know, hmm, you, know. <laughs> you know, the more you know, the more, the more you know, and the more you have to, you know, count on God's grace to change you. So now at that moment, I did not go. I did not decide to go. Sorry. Uh, I just thought about my mortality. I got in my car and I honestly felt lighter. I'm like, hey, that wasn't so bad. I'll come back next week. And so next week I did, I came back, I, I attend the 7.30 in the morning mass. And it was a beautiful day in Chicago, as you know, <laughs> being in Nebraska, it is, you know, hard to find a beautiful spring day anymore. And so my husband says, let's go golfing. And at that time I was going through um, a merger of three different companies in, into one company. So I was so stressed out. I didn't know if I was gonna have a job. Um, you don't need three chief information officers when you're coming down to one company. So I was like not sleeping. My neck was on fire. And guess what? When you lean down to hit the golf club, your neck is <laughs> a little bit stressed. And I, I was, I couldn't do it. I, I played about three holes and I told my husband I had to go just lay down and put my head back. So I got home, laid down, put my head back and out of nowhere, this thought almost like a screaming thought comes into my head. Confession at two o'clock after Spanish mass, because there's a large Hispanic community. And I'm like, where the heck did that come from? And I rolled over, I looked at the clock and it's one o'clock. And I thought, I can go. Hey, maybe it'll make my neck feel better. I don't know. So I grabbed a pen, I grabbed an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and I start writing. And I keep writing and I keep writing. I flip it over, I write, and I fill out both sides. 26 years, by the way, has been the amount of years that I have been to confession. So there's a lot to recall, and I'm pretty sure I didn't recall all of it. So um, I got in the car, folded up that piece of paper, tuck it, tucked it way down deep in my purse, and I went to confession on Divine Mercy Sunday, not having a clue what that meant and the graces that were going to flow into me. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And by the way, I can't get into too much because we don't have too much time on the confession, but I wrote a book, um, Am I Catholic? Uh, Struggle with Faith, Humility, and Surrendering to God. It's a very fast read. It's also available on Audible if you want to hear me narrate my story. But the confession story is hilarious and emotional at the same time. People are like, that's the best confession <laughs> story ever. So I can, uh, I can cut to the chase because I believe that this was the moment that my life changed in this beautiful sacrament of reconciliation, confession, as many people know it. So I walk in and I'm pretty nervous. I don't know what to do. All I remember is from the movies. Thank goodness for the movies, because at least I, I knew to say, I did not know that there was an examination of conscience out there, but I knew when I knelt down to say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, but I said it like this, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Get a load of this. It's been 26 years since my last confession. Like, exactly like that trying to make light of it, trying to make a joke because I was pretty embarrassed and I wanted to lighten what I was feeling in, my, in myself because I was thinking, I'm gonna get chewed out in this confessional. He is gonna scream at me. I am gonna get this penance of the century. You know, like I was scared. I went in as this person thinking God is a judgmental God, not God is a merciful, forgiving, loving God. So after I say that, the, the priest in the most beautiful, peaceful, calming voice says, welcome home. And that was the moment that I lost it. Just, I mean, it's almost as if I'm right there. That mm -hmm. was the moment that I knew it's not going to be a, a chewed out session. God loves me. And that priest, i thank him every day because, and this is what happened. I just started crying and tears were coming out of my eyes. I, that someone just turned on the faucet, drip, drip, tsh, tsh, tsh. 
you can hear them hitting the page. I couldn't read the page because I had so many tears in my eyes and now the ink is all blurry <laughs> and my lump in my throat was so big. I, you know, oh, it was such an amazing moment of relief. Just, oh my gosh, I am home. And I didn't think that at the time. Looking back, I now understand how powerful those words are. So if there's any priests that happen to be watching this, or if there's anybody who is afraid to go to confession, know that it is the most incredible sacrament and gift we have outside of the Eucharist in our faith. So I pull myself together and I finally get through, a, you know, my whole page, my list and all, and then it comes to him absolving me of my sins. And this was my other signal to start bawling. And as I'm crying, I have this out of body supernatural experience. I honestly floated out of my head about a foot. I could see the back of my head and everything around me, almost like it's in a picture in my mind right now, perfectly. Only for a few seconds. And then when I came back into my body, I couldn't feel it. I knew I was kneeling. I knew I was there, but I was like, almost like resting in the spirit. The outpouring of the spirit was in me in a way that was so peaceful. It was like this warm waterfall of peace. And then like down from my toes that came back up was this energy of joy. I had this radiance. I, it was incredible. I walked out of that confessional. By the way, I had to have been in there for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. There wasn't a Kleenex in there. I had makeup all over my face, snots all over my arms. I mean, I was a mess and I come out and all of a sudden I look over there at the line. It is outside the church through the narthex out the door. And I'm thinking, oh, I got to get myself out of here. I think they just think I murdered someone, you know? So I, I, ended up, I was so embarrassed and I was like, okay, I'm just going to get to is my car. Is there another way out of here? Can I right. just- I got to walk by all these people. So I get into my car. I floated out of that church. I floated. I got in my car. I turned around and I looked back to that door and I said, what in the heck was that? Like that was God. Now I have taken many a drug in my life and drank quite a bit. I could have taken them all at the same time and never had that feeling of peace, almost ecstasy. I couldn't explain it. I knew it wasn't of this world. And the spirit within me put this thirst to learn what is this Catholic faith all about? Because I think that's what they call a sacrament because I didn't even know what a sacrament was, but that was a game changer for me. And now I go to confession every single week. I'm a daily mass goer life with the Lord and my prayer life and my relationship and love affair with him has changed everything in my life. Even though in the beginning of my journey, I thought I had to change once I came to the truth of all of the teachings. I mean, like I had to change everything, what I thought, how I spoke, what I said, what I did. And in the beginning, I just put it all on myself and kept falling and kept running to confession, kept falling, kept running to confession. And I think that's do. the, yeah, I know. But there's a moment of hopefully humility. And this is where I speak to men and I say, humility is not weakness. The more humble we can be in, in to the Lord as his creatures and his creation. I mean, he loved us to creation. The more our hearts and our, our, our disposition as we go to mass, as we enter prayer, as we you know, pray to the Lord and ask for his mercy to change us and his graces. We're open to those graces. A lot of pride, you know, like I can do this. That's what I had to battle a lot in the beginning of my journey was the fact that it's not my willpower, it's God's will. <laughs> and once I understand that I need him to, to help me with everything, not just transformation of, of my sinful ways, but everything, my life, you know, has slowly but surely changed in miraculous ways and beautiful spiritual gifts have come my way. So men, humble yourself in front of God because he is 
just waiting for you to ask for his help and he will and you'll be sitting there thinking wow how how come i waited so long <laughs> to open my heart and know that i can't do anything with god as we know that's that's biblical with god we can do everything without god we can do nothing so yeah that's sort of my um initiation back into the church i would say my initial moment of the spirit moving in me and me understanding that wow god exists pretty amazing awesome. story and pretty powerful in that how god works he works in so many different ways and each person's individual you know i'm, I'm always i'm always grateful that i've never been one of those people who have resented god or hated god or was mad at God for stuff. Um, but if that's you, know that God allows things for a reason. And as we continue down that walk, a lot of the times it's, it's to humble us and to help us go to him to get through the hard times. And uh, he's just the ultimate healer. I always think of the Trinity as God, the Father, the Creator, the Lover, and Jesus as the Son, the Healer, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit within all of us is the Transformer and the Sanctifier. And I call on each one of them in different ways. Um, I do pray to all three. I don't use that generic God very often, um, but it's just so powerful, the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding that can come if we just allow ourselves to be little children and say, God, I'm not really sure <laughs> what's going on here. I don't know about this Catholic faith, but I know I want to know more and he'll just continue to grow in you. It's such an amazing thing. Kendra, you spoke a little bit about humility and that that's not a bad thing for men. I know you've given talks to men. What are some of the things that you would say to the men out there that are listening right now? Oh, okay. So again, I mentioned my entire life. I didn't really know about God, speak about God, and most of my family and people that were around me didn't either. But there were a few men in my life who had a massive impact before I started my faith walk. And let's just take my father, for example. Not talking about I mean, I never had the birds and the bees talk. I never had the respect your body talk. I never had the you are valuable as a human being. Don't give that away. Um, save it, save for marriage. You know, find that one person. Uh, we were all very worldly. Mm -hmm. But I remember one, <clears throat> one time we were going to a carnival, 4th of July, and a friend of mine, this is when the jean short cutoffs were a big thing. <laughs> Everyone was cutting off their jeans and fraying them. And so I was, um, I think, 14, and I cut them a little high. <laughs> and my father, um, you know, I came down and my, my, my girlfriends were higher than mine, let me just tell you, but mine were pretty high. And he looked at me and he said, go upstairs and change. And I looked at him and it, for a moment, was like, come on, man. <laughs> yes, I did say that. No way. And then I thought, wow, what a loving thing. Like, my dad doesn't want me to be cheapening myself and throwing myself out there and having people look at me in a cheap way that I'm an object. Mm. And that was probably one of the moments that I was like, hey, that was cool. Thank you, dad. So I, I didn't thank him, by the way. I pretended like I was all upset and everything went up and changed and, you know, pouted for a little bit and then got over it pretty quick. But I will say for anyone who's watching who is a father, you stating and standing up and having these discussions with your daughter or even your sister, this doesn't have to be a relative, but sharing how you respect them and how important it is, especially to the young girls today. I can't imagine growing up in today's day and age where everything is so objectified and sexified and it's your body is pretty much your value. And I had that warped sense of what love was. I thought that love was me needing to be attractive 
to men and in order for them to love me. And then of course, society and movies is, you know, was just casual sex was one of the things that was accepted. And so, hey, if I want that guy to like me or love me, I better do things with him in a sexual way. And boy, you know, thanking the Lord to have brought me to the value of my identity as his daughter. And also that this body is a gift. This body is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit within me. And so again, I didn't come to that realization. I mean, I'm in my forties and I'm still flirting with people. I mean, I'm married. My husband knows who I am. He knows I'm a flirty person. Um, I'm kind of a raunchy joke teller, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a guy's gal. I grew up with a couple of brothers in hockey. So I'm, I'm, I'm totally comfortable with the guys. I've been sitting at the boardroom. I've, I was a truck driving potty mouth swear. The F word came out of my mouth every other word <laughs> practically. Um, you know, I was, that's just who I was. And I thought that that was cool. I thought, Hey, you know, I tried to almost be a guy, right? I mean, I'm living in the man's world in the, in the corporate life. And so I'm going to hang out with the guys and I don't want to be this prude. So at the end of the day, there were two other guys that were executives in corporate America. Speaking of potty mouth, one man was my peer. He was one of the three who were in that merger. Um, by the way, I got the job <laughs> um, out of the three, but he was one of my peers and we were talking one day and I was so upset about what was going on. It was a very cancerous um, organization at that time, so toxic. I was dropping every swear, every other word, and he wasn't that man. He was a man that always talked about his wife and his children and his faith. He was, a, he was Christian, not Catholic, mm -hmm. but always talked about church, church activities. But he wasn't a, a, an off-putting, because at that time, that might have off-put me, right? Like, this guy's right. not what I'm all about. He was a normal, if you will, very relatable man. But the way that he held himself and the way that he didn't talk about others, the way that he wasn't gossiping, um, the way that he respected his team and had them, you know, held in high regard, but was also open to understanding if there were issues. I was going off on this phone call and I, and I just stopped out of the blue. I'm like, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry for swearing so much. And, I, and then he's like, that's okay because he's not pushing his stuff on me. I'm just noticing that he's not that way. Mm -hmm. And so I said, how come, how come you don't swear? And he responded with, because I choose not to. That stuck with me. I choose not to. And I thought, how do you choose not to? I don't think I could stop if I tried. Yeah, you can do anything with God. So that was one. And then another one, I'll share this one really quick. He was a peer of mine. We were um, the VP level at this, at this stage of my life. And he was in, um, I, I won't get into too much more because someone might be able to put two and two together, but he comes into my office and he says, do you have a moment? And I said, sure. He goes, I got a, I got a real problem. My wife cheated on me and she cheated on me with uh, the pastor of our church. And I am sitting here looking at him going, oh my goodness, I cannot even imagine the betrayal that you are feeling from a church leader. By the way, I have no idea what a pastor is versus a non denominator or a priest, a pastor. A, I have no, no clue. Um, but, the, but he's a leader of a church, you know, are you kidding me? I mean, of all the people that you put your faith and your trust in, and then your wife does this. So he, he doesn't wipe her all over the ground, which I would have. I would have been, you know, calling my husband every name in the book and chastising the pastor and all of that, bad-mouthing everybody. He just wanted someone to talk to and then said, I just have to think about what I'm going to do. And I looked at him and I said, you got to think about that? I would be kicking her to the curb. He's got two kids. One was probably about 10. The other one was 12. And I still was thinking, no way could I forgive either one of them. Forgiveness wasn't, right, something that I knew I had to do and such a gift from God. So he comes back in a couple of months later and shares with me that 
he's not only reconciled with his wife, but he is going to move to another state and actually start up his own church and become a pastor. Actually, it's not a church, but he's going to start up his own thing yeah. and become a pastor. And I looked at him and I'm thinking, what? Are you kidding me? You're going to leave all this money? Because he was telling me, he's like, I got to sell my car. I got to downgrade, blah, blah, blah. And I was amazed at the fact that this man forgave his wife and was going to leave all of the material world behind. Lo and behold, that I know I was going to be kind of following that the path same thing. myself. <laughs> Right? So I, I guess my point to men is humility is, is just living your faith the best way you know how. Having integrity and strength to do what you know is right and to speak about it and live it. Your actions speak way louder than words. You know, you don't have to be out there saying, Lordy, Lordy, Jesus is my savior. And that you, you just act in a way and support and help women because we need men. I am telling you, yes, I speak for myself, but I'm pretty darn sure that I'm going to speak for a lot of women here. What happened to men? True manly men who are the leaders of their family. I have a husband who's not where I am on the journey. And when I say not, he's not going to mass. He is on a journey, I will tell you that. I have seen some major spiritual changes in him. And as a matter of fact, he is my mirror a lot of times. And I, I look at him, I'm like, man, you are like one holy man. Now get your tail to church, <laughs> you know, like we should be going to mass. But you can't, you know, women out there that are watching this and men out there, if your wives aren't on the journey, you just have to love them to the faith. Love them more, love them more, be more patient, be more kind. And they will, it just draws you closer in a way that you let God do the rest. But without having that kind of male spiritual leadership, I, in the beginning of my journey, the only men that I were list, that I would pay attention to or listen to were priests. So this is going out to any priests out there, any people who are considering being priests. I actually spoke to 160 priests uh, in the Rockford Diocese this past September. Um, I talked to them for three hours about what women need from our spiritual fathers and how important it is for them to teach us how to pray, to go to Jesus. It's, it's not them, it's, they're not our savior. They could probably save themselves a lot of time if they had more programs that were focused on how each one of us, men and women, can build that intimate relationship with God so that we can hear God's voice and do God's will. Um, so that was a that was an amazing experience, and I loved all of those priests. And it was wonderful because they came up afterwards and said, "I learned so much." You know, I mean, I think sometimes maybe priests might be afraid of the women in their parish because they just don't get us. And us women look to men. There's nothing more awesome than seeing a man with a rosary in his hand, on his knees, praying in adoration. It's, it's powerful. It's not a weak thing. I saw it. Uh, so there was a man that I know was converted a year ago. He's this big, burly, 6'2 dude. And he comes into the Adoration Chapel, squeezes his big self into these tiny little pews, gets down on his knees, whips out this rosary, and looks and gazes at Jesus the entire time. And I thought, that is a man. Wow. And there are times when I pray with my husband just really quickly, um, you know, for meals. He just kind of sits there. But, um, you know, I just, I desperately desire that spiritual leadership in my family. And I tell him all the time, you know, you're the spiritual leader. I'm not. You know, I, I pray. I, I have Father Ripperger's um, prayers for the, the deliverance prayers for the laity and being married, you do have, you know, some, 
say so over the other spouse's uh, soul, not exactly as he does over mine, but yeah, I pray, I pray, I pray. So I just think that men being men who are stern and stick with their faith, they're not wishy-washy. They don't sometimes do this and sometimes do that, but they are consistent with the people around them, whether it's at work, the way that they treat people, the way that they actually give credit to God. That's been the big difference that I see in humble men is when they give credit to God, when they don't take that credit themselves and say, oh, you know, you don't have to be like, praise God, praise God, praise God. But, you know, every now and then it'd be nice to say, I owe it all to God. Yeah. You can just say it in those simple terms. And I'm telling you this world, the, the heads will tilt like a puppy dog, like, what? You owe it all to God. And something will click in that person to be like, huh, I never really thought about God in any of my life. And so you could be evangelizing out there as well. And, and I guess, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think? What do you think is humility to men? I think you touched on it there, Kendra. I think that piece of one, just realizing that it's not just me, that I do need help and I can't do it all by myself. And when I do think that I did it all by myself, there's going to be a time where I'm going to get knocked down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get hit upside the head with a two by four or something's going to happen to make me realize that, yeah, you did it all by yourself. Right. And have that and be humbled. Cause if you don't have humility yourself, you will be humbled. Yes. At some point in time. Amen to that. And I think it's just being grateful and thankful is humility as well. So always and everywhere to give you thanks. Every mass we pray, always and it, it is right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. So when we do, thank the Lord for all of the little things. I mean, there are days when I go through just thanking him for running hot and cold water, thanking him mm -hmm. for the coffee, for the slippers on my feet. This week, I've had to put socks and slippers on my feet, and I'm grateful for the fact that I have those. Of course, your house and you know your, your jobs, your material things, but we also should thank him for our faith, for the kindness and, and the graces that he's poured out in our lives, for the transformation that we slowly but surely see on the journey and of course, even those massive things, maybe you've had some incredibly big thing happen in your life. That's what he did healing my addiction through my uh, Marian consecration to Jesus through Mary. It was an amazing moment. Um, and everyone, I think if we just had hope and more trust and faith that God, <laughs> the miracles aren't just from back then in the Bible, they're happening every day to everyone. So if men, you're struggling with sinful behavior, addictions, you know, lust, pornography, it's, I'm, I'll, I'll go there. I was, I was exposed to pornography at 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And my, that, you think that helped me with my warped idea of love? Uh, no, it was even worse. And so then everything else started to become a physical object. I was a physical object to be used by men. And I didn't consciously know that. It was just more subconscious. So um, when I found out that watching pornography was a mortal sin, I didn't get it in the beginning because I'm like, well, what's the difference? I'm in the room all by myself, you know, and of course, self-gratification and uh, everyone put your Jesus eyes and ears on and, you know, purify your, your, what you're hearing here. But I didn't think it was a bad thing. It was accepted by the society and the world, you know, for the most part, everybody kind of does it, don't they? I mean, it's free out there on that internet thing and come to find out after reading the theology of the body and how precious our gift of intimacy is between a man and a woman in the sacrament of marriage, it changed everything. It, it made pornography to me just, I pray for all those people who are objectifying those people on the videos and on the movies. 
Um, that industry is brutal and those people are broken. They're broken and they are searching for love and they're searching for God. And that could be your mother, your daughter, your sister, your brother. And it just changed everything for me, uh, understanding the true gift of the body that we have. And it's not men, you're not alone. There are a lot of women out there that do that too and are struggling with it. It's what this culture has deemed normal and acceptable. And it's quite horrific when you really think about it. And maybe that can be in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind the next time you're ready to take that step into that sinful, mortal, sinful behavior and run to confession if you have any mortal sins on your soul. Please do not wait. You don't know the day or the hour that you're going to meet your maker. Or get hit by that proverbial bus, as you talked about earlier. <laughs> exactly. Ugh. Scary. We all must be ready. And change gears real quick. Yeah. You've done quite a bit of work recently with mental prayer. And you actually have an ebook out there that the men can get and the women can get too. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Master your mind in mental prayer. So I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone that doesn't want to hear the voice of God, who doesn't want to fight the distractions in prayer, who wants to have that meaningful, loving relationship with the Lord. And guess what? It's required. We're all called to be saints, period. End of discussion. I'm pretty sure most people know that. But I think we all think, well, that's not for me. I, I'm not holy enough. I, I, you know, that's for that person. That's for, you know, Mother Teresa, not me. But they're all normal people as well. And there are nine levels of prayer. And the first level is vocal prayer, which we all do. Our Father, Hail Mary, the chaplet, the rosary. You can make the rosary and the chaplet meditative mental prayer. And when I'm saying meditative prayer, I mean Christian meditation, not the new age, Buddhism, universe kind of meditation. Um, you can make those mental prayers if you truly meditate on the mysteries and you're focusing. But a lot of times we just recite the rosary and we check off that box. It's just becoming a, it becomes a vocal prayer. The second level is mental prayer. So then there's seven other levels all the way up to this perfect union with God. I won't get into all the, layer, the layers of the levels, but mental prayer, according to St. Teresa of Avila, is the gateway to all the other seven. And every single saint had incorporated mental prayer a minimum of 15 minutes in their daily lives. And you cannot avoid sin if you do not practice mental prayer every day. That's St. Alphonsus Liguori who said that. But the good thing is, is if you do practice mental prayer every single day for 15 minutes at a minimum, Satan knows that he has lost your soul. And that's from St. Teresa of Avila. How cool is that? So if you don't incorporate it, you're not going to stop sinning. But if you do incorporate it, Satan knows he's lost you. And so mental prayer is something that takes practice. By all means, it's not easy. And not every day is perfect. Some days are real struggles um, to keep yourself focused and to learn what it is to meditate. Because you don't just sit there and you try to empty your mind. Mental prayer is going inward with God and loving God. It's really, as you know, prayer is lifting your mind and heart to the Lord. But you can say that and not feel like you're in a loving conversation with him. And so I am putting together an online Master Your Mind retreat. Um, I can bring it to you. We can do something online. I think I may have it out there um, available for anyone to, to go to. Like I have a 40-day initial prayer program. So mental prayer will come after you get into the practice of praying every day. Not even, Some people don't even have that going on in their lives. So if that's the case, 
you can go to my website. I'll have two, two downloads for you, by the way, that are free. Here's another ebook. This is uh, Need a Miracle Now. And this has prayers for um, five different kinds of struggles that we all face. So you have maybe illness of yourself or someone. Maybe you have an addiction. Maybe you are struggling with stress, anxiety, and worry. Maybe you have financial problems. Or maybe you lost someone and they passed and you're struggling with that heartache and that absence. So in this book, in this ebook, there's, you know, 21 pages of prayers and saints that you can pray to and Bible verses to help you get through what you're dealing with in those categories. There's also the wonderful nine day surrender novena, which is offering it all to Jesus. There's a St. Joseph prayer. There's a couple of other bonuses and that's free. But if you download that, there's a discount for the 40 day prayer program, which I'm, I walk with you for 40 days, 15 minutes a day. I send a three minute email to you with a three minute video. And we focus on one thing every day and it builds on itself. And by the end of those 40 days, I'm pretty sure that you're going to have some graces. You'll have a pattern. 40 is a number that's biblical. It's a challenge. And it's about the time that it takes to incorporate a habit. And then from there, you can get into that mental prayer and you can hear God's voice. I actually focus on scripture. It's the living word. And every single day in the daily readings, I find something that God is speaking to me. For example, pick up your cross daily and follow me. I must have read that a million times. And one day as I was in mental prayer, I was reading through the readings and the word daily almost jumped out and slapped me in the face. It was so like, it was screaming at me. So all I did was meditate on that word. It's a daily commitment. We are called to worship the Lord. It is just, it's unjust not to pray and not to worship. We must, we must, it's the first commandment. And so, so many people struggle with prayer and I just want to bring the joy of prayer and the love that comes out of true mental prayer. And then that day, you now can focus on something that you hear God talking to you. It's, it's an amazing journey, my prayer journey. And I want to tell everyone that, hey, you heard what I used to pray. Lord, can you give me this? Lord, can you give me that? I mean, I had no relationship with him. And then when I wanted it so desperately, I didn't know how to get it. How do you pray? So I took it upon myself. It's a commitment and it's just that childlike learning. God, I want to get closer to you. I want to know you better. I want not only to do your will, but I want to live in your spirit and live in your will. Have you with me every moment of every day, always and everywhere, thanking you and seeing you in my life. That was a long, long answer. <laughs> to that. <laughs> so Kendra, how do they get your information and get involved in your prayer journey? So you can go to my website. First, download the freebies. I mean, at least take advantage of the free stuff. Um, you can go to my website, uh, KendraVonEsch.com, and we should have a link for that as well. And you can go to Faith Services. I do also provide some faith coaching. So some people want a little bit more one-on-one -on -one attention. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the prayer program is, at, is automated and you could do it anywhere, anytime. It never expires, so you can go back. Um, and oh, by the way, there's all these comments from all the prior people who participated in the course. And so you not only get my resources, but you get their resources and their comments. So it's, this, it's turning into this big knowledge um, center, if you will, of faith. Um, that is on faith under my faith services on my website under courses. But if you're look, looking for any other of the services that I offer, it should all be under there. And then if you want to attend any of my events in person or online, that's under my events tab. And just send me a note, go to my contact page, send me an email. If you're looking for any more information or you just want to talk, um, I'm here. It's, I mean, bear with me. I am not the I've got a lot going on. I, I'm not the fastest person in response, but I do, um, I do respond to every, every outreach that I get. So I'm we'll here. We'll put all you. those links in the show notes too. 
Excellent. Sounds perfect. Thank you. That's my mission. My mission is to help others deepen their relationship with God and the beautiful Catholic faith, because there are so many resources and ways in which we can deepen our relationship with God with the Catholic sacraments and the saints and all the resources that we have, the sacramentals. It's just amazing. What a faith. What a faith we have. And I think sometimes we just take it for granted. It's amazing. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) (laughs) And you've had an amazing journey. And thank you for sharing your journey with us today, Kendra. Well, thank you for being so patient. I, I have no loss for words. I could go on and on and on. So I hope we didn't run too late. I clearly haven't noticed the time. Uh, Thank you and God bless. Oh, God bless you too. Take care. Thanks for having me.